question, I would uh, ask uh, the last speakers uh, to uh, uh, give a talk on the project that is actually dealing with the uh, borders. Uh, and it's a curatorial project. Uh, so uh, Andrea uh, Hribernik and uh, Maya Antoncic will present the project. They are both uh, curators, uh, and uh, uh, Maya Antoncic is uh, uh, working, but working in two different uh, Slovenian art institutions. Uh, Maya Antoncic is uh, uh, at Center for Contemporary Art uh, Arts in Celje. Uh, curator and also uh, working uh, uh, in pedagogical program and she has also uh, finished the uh, uh, curatorial uh, a year curatorial course uh, which is quite known in Slovenia uh, at uh, uh, entitled World of Art uh, while Andrea Hribernik actually has this experience um, of uh, being a selector for uh, uh, Venice Biennale in 2017, where actually uh, the work was uh, that was exhibited that represented Slovenian pavilion actually dealt with uh, it was uh, uh, the train of shadow. I don't know is it the right. I hope it's right in English uh, by Nika Autor, who actually dealt with with this uh, topic of migration. Uh, and uh, Andrea is uh, the director of the Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art Koroška in Slovenia Gradec. It's a small city, but it's quite interesting gallery. And uh, um, she is actually um, focused on museums and their utopian dimension and the heritage of socialism. Uh, but now uh, I, I would like you uh, to yeah, give you the floor and uh, present uh, the project you have been working on. Thank you, Irena, and uh, thank you for the invitation. So we structured our presentation in two parts. In the first part, I will, um, actually I planned to make a little bit different presentation, but due to all of the presentations that I heard today, I will try to refer some of the topics you tackled within your presentation now and try to draw them to the ideas and thoughts we are thinking about and developing within the project. A curatorial project, as you mentioned, uh, Irena uh, called, it's called uh, Borderlines. Um, it's quite a short title for a much more complex uh, project. And uh, Maya and me, uh, we are working actually um, I would say um, in the sense that uh, through artworks, we try to think uh, these, all these aspects dealing with borders and of course also migrations, uh, as this is the, one of the main topics of this talk, um, as I understood. So, um, so this first part of the presentation, which I would be giving, would be more an ex excursion as uh, into some of the issues uh, that we have to address while talking about migrations. So it will be more sociological and anthropological ideas which we are actually developing our projects from. And then in the second part, Maya will uh, share more light on the project, what is already happening and how we plan to develop it further. So, um, but before I go to this presentation, I would say, Irena, that this, uh, what addressed me especially within this conference, uh, this concept of transmigrancy, which I think it's very interesting. And I would put parallel to this transmigrancy, which is actually as um, um, Anna, Dana Beres defines it, as you, as you quoted it at the beginning, it's not only going Across the borders, but also going or moving within the social strata, or so to say. This is how I understood this, though I didn't read uh, the book. But for example, what we uh, with Maya were talking at the beginning uh, was another concept which I find very uh, interesting and also maybe connected a bit to this transmigrancy is hybrid identities. Um, and this hybrid identities is something that, uh, for example, we in Slovenia, and of course also elsewhere, but here I'm coming from our experience um, 
are, are quite um, um, kind of um, addressed by because uh, Slovenia as a country has been subjected to many changes in terms of identity and in terms of this changing of borders, of course. So as a consequence of changing of borders, it was also the changing of identity. And this hybrid identity, I understand also as something which is very uh, potential for thinking about how to, um, how to think about identity in the future, because we cannot focus it on whether one nation or one, one cultural alliance, it's more mixed, uh, mixed one. And this is some, some, some kind of an idea, a potentiality that I would address, which is also uh, connected to the places on the borders. So the border, which is in our case, our topic is now uh, coming in the foreground. Um, but, but actually the border was only a starting point and a starting point was also the idea to make an exhibition on the 100th anniversary of Corinthian plebiscite. plebiscite. Uh, so um, an event which put a border uh, between uh, previously, um, I would say, uh, put a border in the landscape and um, uh, between people who were previously for centuries living in one one joint country, this was Austro-Hungarian um, kingdom. So this border which divided at that time Yugoslavia and then, um, uh, I mean, Yugoslavian kingdom and then um, Austrian Republic was the one, like this anniversary, this remembrance was one thing that we started from. And um, here I would begin with this, um, with this um, short excursion into a bit more uh, historical and theoretical uh, part of our presentation um, is that, for example, um, what is very crucial when thinking about migra migrations is exactly this um, end of, sec of First World War, actually, which, as I said, put the border, which we actually are considering the Austrian-Slovenian border, but what happened after the First World War, and I think what is very crucial also in thinking about mi migrations, is that um, the legal precedence was established on which it was possible for the nation states to strip their previously naturalized citizens of the citizenship. Meaning that after the First World War, when the world has rearranged and when, the, when it was for the first time that these great powers started dividing, it was possible for some countries to say, okay, this group of people, which uh, because pre uh, citizenship was previously more bound to the territorial uh, alliance, meaning that if you lived within one country, with, within borders of one country, it was more or less that you were citizens, citizen of this country. But after the First World War, it was possible for the countries to strip some of the groups, which they considered maybe not so in line with their national identity or culture, to be stripped of this uh, citizenship. Uh, this was not such a big case after the First World War, but I'm mentioning it because it's an important precedence uh, which becomes uh, very important, of course, in the Germany before the, the, the Second World War, when this was actually the legal basis that they stripped the citizen, uh, stripped uh, Jews of their citizenship, meaning that this was the legal basis that that, that they denationalized the Jewish communities in Germany on the basis of which they, of course, could do the atrocities that we all. No, and I would not like to go in it. Even like Hannah Arendt, who is dealing more uh, um, into depth in the, with this uh, in the origins of totalitarianism, even says that it was possible to see the alliance between uh, the what was the number of the people that were stripped of citizenships and the level of totali totalitar totalitarianity in one of the states. So meaning that this was uh, actually uh, a correlation. So why am I I'm talking about this? Of course, because uh, the current situation with migrations, uh, with mi migrants who are actually stripped of their citizenship, um, who are um, homo sacer, as also Davor 
before referred to in his uh, talk, who are actually being stripped of their political um, rights, um, are actually the consequence of all this historical de development. Unfortunately, we don't have time within this presentation to go more into depth into kind of trying to develop this, but just a few kind of, I would say more in a sense of elevator pitch, um, um, mentioning few few concepts that, that we are actually considering, is, is to see how this, um, these developments of how uh, the uh, developments and the fail, uh, failed uh, objective of making human rights uh, and human, one of the basic human rights is also um, the, that every person is a person before the law. That means that every person is a political, has a political entity, um, is actually um, failing. And it is interesting that uh, the Charter of Human Rights, which I'm referring to at this point, which was of course accepted by the United Nations, uh, by the United Nations in 48, is stating this as one of the basic human rights. And paradoxically, it is stating this in the moment when this becomes a problem. So after the Second World War, when it becomes a problem that of course the citizenship citizenship is not anymore bound to whether territorial but it becomes more and more uh, the the cultural uh, concept um, as um, um, becomes more and more cultural concept is actually becoming uh, it has has to be written down in a charter of human rights so um, so actually the stateless persons and refugees are the, I would say, or I would allow, allow to say that these are actually um, more a contemporary uh, concept. And this is something that contemporary society is producing. And why is this happening? Um, is uh, because we were, um, now I'm referring to doppelganger, who before said a very interesting thing, which I think it's quite crucial at this point, that, uh, there are no gastarbeiters anymore, there are only migrants. And this, for example, is an interesting idea. Um, and this idea comes from the, 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 from the, uh, from the um, context that um, gastarbeiters were still economically um, use, um, useful, still economically va uh, va valuable, meaning that uh, migrations, um, still in the modernity or before even in, in industrialization were economically um, um, yeah they were desired and were actually even encouraged as it was in the case of Yugoslavia with the agreement and so on but nowadays when we are facing the surplus of working force meaning with all this technol technologization of society and so on there is no, especially not in Europe, for example, or even the developed world, there is no need for, for the workers, for gastarbeiters, for this, um, uh, this uh, unqualified working force. So to say, and there is not even the need for the qualified working force because it's kind of considered that there is uh, enough. And it is a problem because these migrations that are happening nowadays are actually migrations which have no economic um, benefit for developed societies and this is actually th th that what happens and this is something that here I refer to Membe when he's saying that actually it's it's now uh, we are living in a society where the, the the certain groups are not useful anymore and they have to be managed not used so the migrants and all these groups are managed and they are put on the verge, on the very margin of society, being stripped of human, of political rights, and with this also of human rights. So here, um, it's kind of um, all these processes and all this, of course, capitalistic system, which is producing these processes coming together. And uh, what, for example, uh, I would like to maybe finish at this point, but be like 
uh, open then for comments and questions at the end is that, um, for example, we um, are now uh, nowadays dealing with a situation where um, actually it's um, these excess populations that are like produce, produced and that can no longer be um, exploited by the capital. And um, here at this point, um, I maybe will um, finish. Um, oh yeah, just one comment, uh, because what I found very interested, interesting also what Davor said, because you, when you were mentioning the sea and how actually the sea becomes a very important um, um, player in this uh, limiting of migrations and so on, um, Shortly, I read a text by, by Lopresti in Eflux, who was writing about uh, like, um, the, um, the, the title of the uh, text is uh, um, like a map over troubled water. And she's talking about how actually the necropolitics is uh, being ex uh, exercised by Europe in Mediterranean uh, Sea in terms with its inactivity. So meaning that they just leave the sea, sea <laughs> to do its thing, you know, to, to kind of um, kill as many people as possible because it's not, uh, nothing, nothing happens um, in this way. And here I would finish saying that actually um, if a move, like with a quote from this, uh, from this text by Lopresti, if a movement wasn't a crisis, then we would not need borders at all. So movement and moving is something that I think is very uh, crucial um, in societies today because it's something that can escape the control. And this moving of, uh, of uh, refugees, moving of migrants, moving of population is something that actually disturbs the homeostasis stasis that current system wants to kind of put upon the society. And these, for example, are just one few of the topics we want to address. So I, I think that I thrown out, like I um, gave may maybe too many starting points for thinking, but we see it as really as a process uh, that we are following in this project where actually many things still will open throughout the year. And now I give the word to Maya to tell more about the practic practical. Yeah. Thank, thank you for uh, and uh, hello from my side uh, and thank you for the invitation uh, to participate in this conference um, and thank you also for these interesting contributions and um, and presentations i totally agree with andrea that those presentations will give us uh, more and more ideas and more uh, thoughts um, uh, on this uh, project borderlines. So I will try just to shortly to introduce um, the project. Um, maybe yeah, some technicals um, and some contents um, and some projects uh, within the, the, the project. Um, so yeah, we planned the project um, in 2019. Um, and uh, it was conceived on the occasion of, of course, as Andrea said, of the um, 100th anniversary of the Carinthian plebiscite. Um, so we planned it for 2020. Um, but we, uh, from the beginning, we really planned to deal with the uh, broader concept um, and the occurrence of borders in general. Um, uh, of course, starting from uh, the consideration of the borders that, that mark geopolitical area of Slovenia, uh, so area between Slovenia and Austria. Uh, but because of the corona situation, uh, as many institutions and many individuals uh, faced, we postponed the, the big project. Uh, so two exhibitions who meant to happen in uh, Koroška Galeria in uh, Slovengradec and in Celje at the same time, um, but we still wanted to somehow develop the whole um, idea. You know that um, the, the Corona situation really, really changed many mindsets and many, many uh, situations and concepts around uh, border crossing, um, 
and traveling. So, uh, yeah, ironically, it was a problem, of course, for the exhibition, for traveling artists, for, uh, for transporting the works and so on. But we still somehow wanted to, to show some, some of the parts, uh, which was then uh, at the end, as we see it now, it's a really good um, alternative way actually to present uh, such an important topic um, as, uh, yeah, as a series of, of, of um, smaller events, small presentations and ex exhibitions happening um, in Italian and in Sloven Slovengrad. So we, we share somehow the idea, the two, the two cities of uh, Slovenia share the same idea and we share our, um, yeah, our um, actually projects and those presentations. Um, so as we are, um, yeah, uh, so as Andrea a, a lot, uh, she said a lot about, uh, about the, those uh, theoretical um, beginnings and um, yeah, states. Today, um, the borders are primarily um, actually in a meaning of controlling the flux of the people. Um, and as such, they represent the complex socio-political uh, phenomenon and uh, decisively affect the lives of uh, many individuals. So um, those selected artists um, actually deals with this topic uh, um, and actually uh, geopolitical landscape from various viewpoints and many, many um, of those projects are um, are actually connected to their personal and intimate stories, uh, even family tragedies. Um, so, uh, and they, of course, uh, and as we saw, um, of course, your projects at, at these presentations, um, they somehow uh, are always um, try to, to, to be, um, yeah, to criticize the, the situation around borders and the crossing migrations. Uh, now I will just shortly go through um, through the, those presentations, to, um, those um, projects that we are doing. Uh, so um, really soon after um, uh, lockdown, uh, Andrea and I decided to, to make these small presentations and we uh, immediately in June um, went into the public space to uh, show one uh, really quite strong project of Irvin. Um, so it was a jumbo poster. Um, you can see it um, on the screen share uh, and there says it's time for a new state. Some say you can find happiness there. So uh, we really saw it as, a, as an important move for this exhibition and for the, actually it, it addresses the problematic uh, gestures of our right-wing um, government, which was formed in the middle of the Corona close, close down. Um, and if it, if of course, brings out a lot of questions and a lot of interpretations. Um, but yeah, it started, it started in 2010 when Irvin went to Lagos and saw this jumbo poster and just um, adopted it uh, for their um, uh, work of art. Uh, and of course, people of Lagos um, uh, were really this questioning of NSK, so now Slovenia Shekun state increased a lot. Uh, they thought that this poster is connected to this NSK state, uh, but actually it's the poster of uh, Coca-Cola company. Um, but really, I would like to at this point to invite you to, to, uh, to check this project. On our websites, we have a statement of Irvin itself, uh, so you can read really more about it. But uh, it was a really important step to, to go at first into the public space um, soon after Corona and this, uh, with the, this really strong and maybe a bit provocative statement um, of uh, Irvin Group. So the second project, uh, project were in Slovengrade. So this, uh, this poster happened in Italia and Slovengrade. Uh, and then uh, the second project happened in Slovengrade. Um, so it's an exhibition of Boris Bea uh, on the border heartbreak. Um, this is a reflection on, of, the, of the border 
um, that divided, of course, the region of this Corinthia between uh, the Republic of Austria and Kingdom of uh, Serbs, Croats, and Slovene. Um, and it, uh, it's a special installation. Um, it's uh, like constructed as a, like, yeah, it's a wooden, uh, wooden installation. Um, and uh, this line uh, between two parts has a shape of a, uh, actually part of Austrian, um, Slovenian Austrian border. And of course, as, as you can see, a uh, heartbeat. Um, and uh, the whole construction is carried with the Kinder, Kinder eggs, you know, um, these uh, chocolate sweets, uh, which is really, uh, yeah, for us, for our generation, it's really, really strong reminiscence of this, um, of this. So, yeah, going for the abroad um, for some goods and some some pleasure. So, go go from Slovenia to Austria to 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 bring these pleasures um, in the country. Um, and the third project happened in um, July. It was um, Borderlines Short Films Night um, in Celje. Uh, we, uh, the uh, participating artists were Ibro Hasanovic with short film Note uh, on Multitude, then Damian Kozole with short film, film Borders, um, and then Nika Autors uh, New Surreal 62, uh, Family and Worker, uh, Tara Knight Ahmadi, Week with the Tsar, um, and um, Mark Pujlev's, um, actually, documentary um, film uh, Island. Um, so we, we here on this film night, we, we try to uh, address migrations from this silent view of migration in, migrations in um, uh, 2015. Um, and we moved from there to some more personal stories, uh, intimate stories, um, for example, not allowing um, to, for Iranian people to go to America in 2007, um, 2017, um, and uh, really concrete situation of uh, how the how the the Slovene Gradets Galeria was established. So through Nika's film, and then we ended uh, with the Marks uh, um, with this video of Mark Pujlep, um as a utopian idea uh, when all uh, the nationalities and borders disappear in one moment. Mm, uh, so we are planning still some projects in um, the future. Uh, this is um, Lanach Manchanin, a ge Geometry of Time, uh, and Maya Hodoszczek, uh, Too Simple and Too Easy exhibition, um, and Jure Markota's uh, Neighbors Grass is Always Greener. Uh, so these exhibitions will happen in Slovenian Gradis and, uh, and some uh, workshops and presentations also in, in, in Italia. So maybe now we are too long um, and I will actually finish at this point, but but we are really, uh, yeah, we have uh, quite few plans more with the, with this project. And uh, now, as uh, Andrea has <laughs> said, we are discovering new um, branches of the, the, the really important uh, topics due to um, yeah, to, to actually, not just the corona situations, but um, we're, yeah, deep in our interest in the to a theory um, uh, into, yeah, maybe the some more artistic projects, uh, residences and so on. So yeah, uh, if you have some questions, please, <laughs> you are welcome. Um, sorry. We took a bit uh, too long, long presentation. Sorry. <laughs> no, no need for apologizing. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Now I'm actually asking if somebody else has a question. Uh, okay. So um, I actually also have a comment regarding regarding Andrea what you have said. Um, that, that, that there is like a surplus of workforce. I still have the feeling that like, for example, I mean feeling, not really feeling, but somebody from Germany was telling me that there are certain, um, certain places where they really need workers uh, 
starting from school to, to the whole care system. And I also know that uh, there is actually, there is a lot of uh, programs, especially in Germany, that are already like, uh, like somebody who is a refugee and asylum seeker, they are going into certain programs, I don't know, for taking care of elders or something like this. And then they are going through these programs and uh, by the end of that, they are like, uh, filling in the places which are not so desired or which there is not many workers there or so, something like this so so but I, I I feel that maybe the difference would be that as doppelganger already mentioned that it's not really regulated by the state in a way okay Davor but but feels like that there is much more this kind of uh, yes neoliberal individual responsibility that you need to that you have as a migrant or whoever you have this responsibility to kind of find the right way uh, mm -hmm. uh, or the right, I don't know, job or whatever uh, for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, Davor, you wanted to say something? Just to unmute myself. You asked, are there any questions? I didn't have a question, actually. I also have a comment because uh, I wanted to comment one thing about the borders. I will be short, really. Uh, the borders are not existing like they existed between the two second wars or, or even the second world war because the border of European Union today is, starts in Turkey, you know, and the surveillance uh, of the borders like of the Mediterranean Sea actually starts in Algiers or Tunisia or Egypt. So basically the border as itself is completely transformed or even in Israel, the border checkpoint is not the, at the checkpoint. It starts completely uh, even at your home if you want to travel somewhere. And I think I, that I didn't understood or I understood um, correctly. And Andrea said uh, no economic benefit for Western societies. Uh, when we speak about the uh, people in migrations, I, I think that that is mm, something that uh, we can question by uh, the fact that uh, uh, Germany, is, uh, which needs, uh, I don't know the exact number, but it's like hundreds of thousands of the workers and they need to import workers. Basically, they do the business and uh, professional profiling of the refugees. So uh, when we uh, speak about Syrian refugees, uh, among them there are there is a lot of really high educated people, you know. So uh, uh, I, I saw in the Netherlands, for example, there are offices that are basically are checking the people which are waiting for the papers and waiting for uh, um, uh, asylum or subsidiary protection that uh, the, the people from like small offices are already coming to check what kind of uh, uh, university they are finished so they can basically do a head hunting you know for different kind of companies so I think among the refugees that we cannot speak about that there are no economical benefit. I would say there is a huge economical benefit when we speak about the Germany and Western Euro European societies. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that these two comments uh, from Irena, the first one and your last one are connecting, but I would first uh, comment maybe the, your first comment that the border is not existing as it was. Uh, this is true because it's also changing um, before the border was territorial, even between the, the world wars, but now the border becomes more and more. Um, this what also Maya mentioned, the control of people, meaning that the border is not anymore bound to geographical territory, but it becomes actually more um, fluid and it becomes more uh, untraceable in terms that the control of the moving of the people is the one that actually today defines a kind of a border. So we don't have this, uh, um, I mean, of course, with Corona, this changed, but generally the control of the moving of people, it's important, not so much the physical border. But for example, I was referring to this uh, uh, borders that started to exist because 
they actually start a certain, they produce a consequence, these borders. And of course, this consequence is changing. And today in this society, it's a different one. And I think that what is open and what is especially interesting is how a border would be perceived now after Corona. Because what we saw, for example, was um, during the process of ex um, establishing, for example, a European Union, we all know this process that like with the Schengen border, within the European Union, the borders kind of opened, but outside they became more closed. So meaning that also the transparency of borders is changing in terms depending on where you are. So this is kind of not, it's very much uh, flux, flux, fluctu fluctuating how the border is functioning today. This is somehow, somehow how I see the border. Also in the light of that uh, we are not traveling anymore as in the past, like borders or in the airports. Airports are some areas which are excluded from the territory and so on. So we have all these, um, these areas and these locations which become the transit points. As you said, even in your home, if you don't have a passport, you are kind of in a, in a, you're already at the border in your home. So this is, a, this is a comment to the first one, but now to the, I go to the second one, the economic benefit, which I think was one of the, the topics that opened up um, two comments. Um, here, I was referring, of course, there is a economic benefit from, and this uh, selecting of educated people, as you are mentioning, Davor, Davor is, uh, is, is economically benefiting. But we are talking about uh, like the whole populations and uh, migrants um, are often, we see a concrete situation in Europe, are living in camps, in migrant camps. If it happens that one percentage from these people is selected then to go to work or so on, or to be included in the society, it's true. But I think that still a lot, uh, the majority of these people is excluded from the, the processes of society in the West. I'm speaking more about this first, like this Europe or even North America, what is happening there. So it's actually, um, I was really refer referring here to Membe, um, Achilles Membe, who is um, talking about this excess population where there is no more like migrations um, in the past, in Yug like especially Yugoslavia, I'm going back to this case, when there was an agreement between Germany and in Yugoslavia to export the workers. Now we have uh, people coming to like Europe, uh, wanting to work, wanting to get a better existence, but they are uh, actually first faced with what you were also saying in your presentation, Davor, with the borders which they cannot cross, even physical, um, physical um, like um, um, fences. And then the secondly, they are put into camps or they are put back, like we have this, um, as you also mentioned, the, the news that we have uh, news every day about pushbacks, about how people, they don't want people to enter. So we, here I'm referring to, um, to what uh, Tarizo recalled a society of optimization, because all this, uh, this social group of migrants is actually a surplus uh, this is how he defines it, and it cannot be because due to human rights and due to standards of work, uh, these um, uh, people uh, would um, need to be exploited in order to be functional for the Western system because they would need to do the lowest works. But today's standards uh, and human rights, especially in the West, they um, don't allow this exploitation, so the people would revolt. So in order to avoid these social revolts, they rather manage the people and don't give them the economic rights or so on. So they leave them actually at the margin of society where they are somehow without rights, as to give them a possibility and then they would not be economically uh, feasible 
to, 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 to give these people work. This is something that I was referring to. This is, this is how the, this process was described. And of course, there are still workers coming and getting jobs, but I'm talking about the camps and the pushbacks and these things, which I think it's more of an economic, uh, this, this is my opinion, economic um, um, reason for this. Of course, then in consequence, also uh, social with all these new racisms that are happening in Europe. But above all, I see this, uh, there, there are points in this economic uh, surplus. So this was something maybe now explained more into depth what I was talking about before. I will just give a really brief comment. Uh, um, but we need to understand that there is a lot of hypocrisy when we speak about Western societies. And for example, the women from the camps can work as a sexual, registered sexual workers in Austria without any papers. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the hypocrisy that is going on. And because the people in the camps are waiting for the papers, and at the same time, there is a movement, uh, they call it some papier, uh, in France and Belgium and uh, different kinds of countries where people are living without the papers for years and they can be deported every second. And during that period of time, they are used as a workers, as a labor force, and that's something what is happening in the Russia Federation as well. And also, the yeah, difference. This is, this is something that, I, that you were referring to, and also me. This is something that, because these people, they're working without papers. How they, is that new? That's been happening in the States for like yes. years. Yes, but I mean, I didn't want to open the, the question of the North America and the Latin America as well. But uh, I wanted to stick to Europe. But at the same time, what I just wanted to add is that uh, when we speak about uh, uh, um, uh, the gastarbeiters and when we speak about the, the workers that uh, actually went from Yugoslavia to Germany, there was uh, a state agreement. There are no state agreements anymore. Yes, are, but this is something that we were talking about. And that's a huge difference, you know. And also when we speak about the, the migrant workers, uh, there is one uh, really nice archive of migrations in Vienna. I know that doppelgangers know, uh, know about it. But there is no horizontal migration in Austria, for example. 80%, I think, of the people, uh, the children of the gastarbeiters didn't change their class position. So it's really rooted, you know, that kind of hierarchical class, you know, system in the countries like Austria. And I would say it's, it's pretty much, uh, I cannot speak about UK, for example, but I, I don't think that things are much more different, you know, in that sense. I don't think that like under capitalism, anyone has an upward mobility. That is not the promise that you get when you're migrating to the US from the Mexican border or into Europe right now. People leave for safety, but like upward mobility for your children is like a dream that capitalism promised and has been proved for like three generations now. No, no one actually gets that. And I also don't think that it makes any sense to like talk from a European perspective as if like, the current migration crisis is new or like this kind of like, it just, it drives me crazy that like European exceptionalism as if Europe is dealing with this from the first, for the first time, like Europe has generated the biggest migration crisis that has ever happened after World War II. These histories need to teach us something. The idea of like being sans papier and the fact that the European Union is not looking to like the Obama administration and the kind of regulation they've tried to like est establish to solve this. Um, there's, I mean, we need to learn from these things. Mm. Yeah. And I say that as someone with a lot of privilege and like a passport and visas. Mm. I mean, no, I mean, it was not, um, I mean, I did not, uh, did you understand that I was talking about migrations as a European? Um, I was referring to Europe as a mostly no, I think that Davor was saying, I would like to stick to Europe, and I think that we all need yeah, to. Yeah, no, uh, of course it's a general thing, but I think that, for example, because it, for me it's important, like this, what, what were the questions before, whether it's, it's, is it really like this, that this migration, it's marginalized so much because it's, whether is it or is not economically feasible, but I think if, 
if, if they would be given the political rights, the migrants, whether in America or in Europe, then the, then the governments would be dealing with, uh, with a whole um, new population which would have political rights, which they would have to treat as citizens. And this is happening. They don't want them to, to treat them as citizens because it's more beneficial to leave them there, to have undocumented sex workers, to have people who work without, because they can be exploited. Yep. And this is something that I, that I wanted to tackle also a bit, which is, a, which is actually, a, yeah, a completely economical decision to support racism and all these things because it's beneficial for the existing homeostasis of society. And they really didn't want to sound they were eurocentric, if you meant by that, that I wanted to stick. I wanted to stick to the topic that we opened. Of course, we can speak about the Mexico and the North America, and also we can speak about Israel, and also we can speak about Russian Federation as well. So, but I think there are huge differences between migrations after the Second World War and contemporary migrations, because the contemporary migrations that we speak about uh, actually started in the 90s with the huge uh, uh, migration of the Albanians uh, to Italy, you know, and that's something that Agamben actually, when he, in Homo Sacer, when he speaks about it and the whole, uh, uh, um, how to say, um, I'm missing the English word, uh, um, uh, how the Europe actually started to deal with contemporary migration started in the in the 90s. So I think there are, we need to take a different kind of approaches and aspects when we speak about gastarbeiter on or North South America or Europe. I think there, there are some differences, I would say. I just think that all these histories are related. And if you say these histories start in the 90s and I think, oh, hello, the European Union also starts in the 90s. Like the European Union starts obviously after Nazi Germany and like in trade routes, but like yes. questions that you talk about, I love that I'm like pointing as if it matters, but like, they also start with like different approaches to colonialism and like French colonialism versus British colonialism and who gets citizenship and how it's affected contemporary life in both of these countries and the fact that their border is the most controlled border, like their border, which is a water border, is the most controlled border on earth. It's insane. <laughs> I like talked some shit about the countries where I live and then everything froze. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I don't know if anybody else has uh, some comments or a question because now I think uh, we could actually conclude uh, because I like the way discussion actually developed uh, at the end. Um, but yes, it's very, very difficult process like because from camp you go to the city and what happens in a city then there you know, this is that moment of uh, where are the, this kind of invisible walls of discrimination and racism and how the system is actually pushing you in a certain ways. I mean, I know how things are functioning in Slovenia and uh, I know people living it and a lot of people is actually going for better future elsewhere. But this is just the first step where, eh, well, they ended up here as a number anyway. So it was really like uh, looking somewhere where there is already community, when there is a more opportunity to get a job or to kind of create this kind of something called home. So, so in that sense, it's really, yeah, I think there is a re really a lot of problematics around the whole thing and around the whole process. And the border and the trip, it's like the beginning of one trauma and I, we, I, I have, kind of have this impression that it really continues and it, it really intersects with a, with a lot of different uh, aspects. And from the, from the trauma of back home to the trauma, which is new one. And uh, I also know that like this moment of not being able to understand the language in the country in where you live and constantly going back into what's happening in the news with my own country from homeland and this kind of moment and this kind of moments when this kind of 
uh, back home or the country of origin intersect with the country of, of uh, staying. I think there is a lot of this kind of uh, moments that are making things, yes, to put it easily, complex. So, mm. but yeah, I think we, we open up uh, a lot of uh, very different uh, uh, directions to think this topic through. And uh, still, uh, what I really like appreciate uh, about this uh, Anna, De Anna Dana Beros understanding of transmigration is that she wants to create something positive out of it. So rather not going into this, yeah, not going into that moment of oh, this is really like uh, that kind of moment of victimizations and so on, but rather to kind of understand this transmigracy in much uh, broader level where a lot of us here also live that moment but uh, at the same time there are also like other moments uh, and aspects of that and also I appreciate uh, that Davor actually mentioned this moment of class because it's that moment when you know the gastarbeiters children didn't uh, escape their class they kind of stayed in it so so this is also something which is uh, present even though it's again something that is not so uh, visible, especially given the current precarious uh, conditions of work. I don't know if anybody else has uh, a comment <laughs> or, or wants to say something. If not, then uh, I would uh, conclude and thank you all for, all for uh, being here. Uh, we had an audience uh, live on Facebook, uh, but there was not much communication with them. So in a way, we kind of created this uh, space uh, on Zoom it, in itself. And there was a lot of ma mediated images. And it, particularly when you actually um, showed your uh, film, uh, Doppelganger. So, so it was really like uh, image was mediated on so many media. And I, I don't know, can we do that to the film? So. Anyway, uh, I would like to thank uh, all of you for participating uh, and for your time and for your contributions. Uh, it was really nice uh, to have you here and it would be really nice to kind of be able to go somewhere for a drink at this moment, but uh, this will maybe wait for another opportunity, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you uh, to you all. Bye. 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 Bye.